Okay, everybody, uh, let's uh, let's begin. And uh, thank you for coming to this uh, last uh, session online. And uh, given the the situation uh, with the the virus and so forth, it seemed like a, a good idea to to do it from my office instead of from the classroom and uh, invite everyone to to join online. So thank you for, for coming, for being here. And uh, today we'll go through some review and uh, try to sort of uh, bring out a conclusion from the course as uh, we've been going through it. And uh, looking back at some examples that uh, I've mentioned earlier in the course and uh, hopefully not only giving you a review for in preparation for your exam, but giving you a, a sense of uh, where we were coming from in terms of the course itself and uh, what our thinking might be on the idea of language and art, invention and inspiration. So you have the term paper that will be coming due uh, next week and uh, next week being the sort of review week in between the classes and the exam. And uh, your, your term paper is, uh, as we've mentioned before, and uh, I'm sure by now you have chosen your example and uh, hopefully have been identifying sources that will give you some evidence to support the, the claim uh, that indeed readers, listeners value the selected example, that it is indeed an example of what might be considered verbal art, invention, inspiration. You are able to choose from a variety of sources, uh, was, could have been a poem, movie script, extract from a novel. Uh, you had quite a range of choices. And I've heard from some of you and uh, uh, the choices that uh, you've been making sounded very, very good. Uh, if I hope that uh, you have already made progress on this and will continue to be making progress on it in the in the week ahead. All right, some of the key concepts. Now I mentioned these before, and I just would quickly quickly go through them. the The idea that we we come at this from a particular theoretical model in linguistics, and the approach has been based on what we call systemic functional linguistics. Functional, functional meaning the purpose to which language is put. That is its meaning, that is uh, its, its function, its purpose. And uh, Halliday, M.A.K. Halliday, the, the, the pioneer in terms of this particular approach identifies three metafunctions. Functions, purposes to which any language needs to be able to, to be able to provide in terms of meaning. It needs, you need a way to be able to reflect on the world, to think about the world, express your, your ideas and even in your thinking about how you, how you construe the world around you. And you need a way to relate to other people, to exchange that information, then that, that perspective with others. And finally, the, how it all comes through then in the text, the, what we call the textual metafunction. There are ways then that this uh, comes through and is realized in language. Meaning is realized through the wording. And that wording then has a, a particular structure we looked at uh, the role of, for example, how you actually even begin each sentence. Uh, that already reflects something about how you are developing your ideas in, and putting them forward. How you decide to describe the situation in which you are, which you're talking about, whether it's what kind of happening is taking place. Is somebody doing something? Is somebody feeling something? So there are possibilities in terms of how you construe the world in terms of 
kind of process, the kind of verb, and who initiates those processes, and, and so forth. How you, how you then express the ideas of how certain you are about something. That's related then to mood and modality. When, when we talk about mood, we mentioned that that had to do with how you indicate whether you are giving information, you're making a statement. Well, that's done in your, through the grammar. You take the subject and the finite verb, you put them together in that order, subject, finite verb, you're expressing a statement. Reverse them, you're asking for information. Have no, no grammatical subject, no finite verb, what we call the imperative, you're making a command. Modality expresses uh, whether you think of something as possible, certain, all of this reflects something of your, your attitude toward the person with whom you're communicating, about the subject about which you're talking. Then how you expand from one idea to the next through language has a certain logic. Do you present it just sort of paratactically, sort of a sequence of ideas, this and this and this and this? Or are they developed in a way that sort of has a main idea with supporting information that, that reinforces what it is you're saying? How do you expand your information? Are you elaborating? Are you extending, enhancing, projecting? What kind of texture is given to a text? Is it, is, do you find things repeated, certain words repeated? You get a certain cohesiveness choice of, for example, we said about how you begin each clause theme. Now, if you keep repeating the same thing as theme, well, in that way, you're going to also maintain a, a continuity. And then how you take all of these sort of, because it, a language is hierarchically structured from the simple ideas that underlie it to the ranging up to the text as a whole. You have you have clauses become sentences, sentences become paragraphs, paragraphs become sections, up into the, the text as a whole. There's a, an architecture then, and how you signal that architecture is going to relate to the coherence of the text. But very importantly, we said that language takes place in a context. To really understand and really know how people respond, you have to look at the context in which language occurs. And when we say context, we divided it up into three aspects. You remember field, what are you talking about? Tenor, who is related to who? Mode, how is it being communicated? The register. In a particular context of situation, there's, an, there's a considered to be a, a way of speaking, an appropriate way of speaking. When we talked about Trump, for example, we looked at whether or not the way he speaks is considered presidential. Well, that relates to who he is and how one expects a person in that particular position to behave and to, to use language. There is a register. And speaking and writing are different in terms of the way language is structured. We looked at various examples of speaking as uh, more paratactic. We sort of extend our ideas one after another, but when we have time to think about it, then we, we relate our ideas in a more developed way. We call it hypotaxis. Then when it came to looking at how language is used and metaphor was very important here, we were looking at grammatical metaphor Someone asked me this past week is, what is, is grammatical metaphor, is metaphor, grammatical metaphor? Yes. But there are also examples of lexical metaphor. Metaphor is something quite, quite broad. When we talked about grammatical metaphor, we were talking about, for example, how verbs can be turned into nouns. That is giving a verb a a quality of nounness, remember, the quality of that particular grammatical category. Different from if you were talking about a 
person in saying that they had the example we've been giving. Tim is a rock. He has the quality of rockness. Now, whatever that means to you is going to depend on how you see, how what you see is the meaning of a rock. In the English language, I think that very often to say that someone is a rock would imply stability, strength. I, in other cultures, it, there may be a different view, maybe just simply stubborn, unmovable, not a good quality. So there, what you're doing is you're, you're projecting to that particular person the qualities of something else. Well, just like that in grammar, you're projecting to that verb the quality of some grammatical category. Noun, for example. Deautomatization and foregrounding. It's something I'm going to talk a bit more about today, so right. I won't go into it right now. The other aspects, religious discourse, political discourse, racial discourse, we've looked at many different examples and i would encourage you to go back over and and look at our previous lectures and familiarize yourself with with the examples that we've looked at in class and what if what we've been able to draw out from those examples well one of the major things about this course has been about how we make meaning that is the, the basis of creativity. We've said that that is what distinguishes language from other means of other things that are also meaningful. I mean, you know, how you dress is, is meaningful. How you wear your hair is meaningful. But language is, is something more there. And that is its ability, not just that it, there is meaning, it makes meaning. But well, how does it make meaning? It does so because we, we are making choices. You have a choice in how you're going to construe the world. You have a choice about how you're going to relate to somebody else. You, you have a choice about how you're going to put the text together. And these are the choices that you make. They're meaningful. But at the same time, we have to realize that while we're making meaningful choices, we're making our language, but it also is making us. We also are, in a way, influenced by the grammars that we employ. Language, languages are different. Languages... Uh, have a grammar that gives you a, a particular perspective on the world. And that is going to influence the way that you use language. We, we said that in, for example, in the language of science, the idea that if you're turning everything into nouns and you're making everything sort of uh, turning, instead of talking about experience in terms of happenings, you, everything is a something. Well, that is a, a different perspective than on the world. Seeing the world in a, a more materialistic way that you're, you're seeing the world in terms of objects and nouns rather than in dynamic action. So critical, and this is where we sort of began. What is metaphor? What is a metaphor? And I mentioned to you, uh, Professor Russell Mears, Emeritus Professor at the University of Sydney, Psychiatry. He's written several books. Uh, one of them is, is a manual on how to deal with borderline personality disorder. But in that, he, he talks about a metaphoric cinematic screen on which is portrayed a partially glimpsed personal reality a metaphoric cinematic screen. We're, we're projecting our ideas. And very often we, we project them through the use of metaphor. 
And what we're projecting is our perception of reality. And very often this can be something that might be otherwise more, more, more difficult to put into words. So we find some way to be able to sort of project it almost like on a cinematic screen. Now, grammatical metaphor, as I just was mentioning, is an example of metaphor. The DI idea being that the way we just sort of see the world is through a sort of default, default way. And that is what Halliday calls the relation of congruence. How you represent a thing is as a noun. How you represent a quality is as an adjective. A process is a verb and so on. That's sort of the way you grow up talking. Now, that way in which we sort of see the world as sort of meaning is tied to wording where things are nouns, processes are verbs, words that relate ideas are conjunctions. We can change that. We can redraw it. And this is the, the creativity in language. An alternative. There is an alternative to the default. And that alternative is, for example, we've looked at in the speech of Donald Jung, remember, where he, he talks about, not it reminds us, but it is a reminder. He turned it into a thing. He, he, it's something that exists. He took that verb, that process, and he gave it the quality of nounness, made it concrete. Now, this idea of metaphor resembles, and I mentioned this book before, the Reinventing the Sacred by Stuart Kaufman. He talks about Darwinian pre-adaptations. He takes it out of the sort of field of language. And what he's talking about is uh, in biological evolution where there is a, a pre-existing phenotypic feature and it, it can then be somehow detoured to a new use. And what he calls the, what someone else calls, Shaviro calls the adjacent possible. And by doing so, you're expanding the range of actuality. You're, you're, you're expanding the, the meeting space. And this can be this kind of creativity may not be predictable. It, it is unforeseen, it is unforeseeable. But he goes on, Stuart Kaufman, to say that's not only true in biology, that's true throughout culture, the, the evolution of a culture. There's constantly arising sort of the introduction of a novel functionality, expanding the scope of what was previously thought possible. And he says this, we cannot know in advance the full space of possible novel functionalities that might arise. And therefore we cannot form a frequency-based probability statement about Darwinian pre-adaptations. It, it falls outside of our ability to predict. We don't know where it's going. And this is done by simply exploring the, the adjacent possible. The next idea, the alternative. And in doing so, enlarging the meaning space of language. That, that's why the whole notion, this is what metaphor means. It may be lexical, it may be grammatical, but in the sense that it is, it's exploring the adjacent possible. We saw it in, in verbal science language of invention. It, it comes through in, in the way that we, we write, typically for school for and later you'll see for work, where instead of talking about the world like we usually do, where we're talking about happenings as verbs, we change it. Instead of they educated girls, the education of girls. 
Instead of women acquired the vote, the acquisition of the vote by women. The whole point being we're taking that that clause with a with a verb and and with participants, and we're turning the clause into what's called a nominal group. Some might call it a noun phrase. We're turning what is a happening into a, a thing, a something, an event thing. But when we do so, there's other things happening as well. The, the conjunctions, we're not joining clauses anymore. We're joining noun phrases or nominal groups, things. So in that case, what we need is something that will join them. And what can you use? But a verb, the verb has a, which relates those events together, cause and effect perhaps. And so there's that shift. Grammatical metaphor isn't, isn't just about turning verbs into nouns. Verbs, adjectives, yes, shifted into nouns. That's, that's quite common. Conjunctions into verbs. You see, it's a, it's a whole scenario of various features that are being shifted. In this case, you might say sideways. But at the same time, you could also think of it as sort of being shifted downwards instead of a complex clause with two clauses joined by a conjunction. You simplify it in terms of one clause with two noun phrases. And that's what you see in, in this example, the education of girls preceded the acquisition of the vote by women. It's a simple sentence, a simple clause, one verb, two nouns. The clauses, what happened to the clauses? Well, they became, in this case, nominal groups. They sort of shifted from that sort of category of clause down to group. It, it's, it's sort of, you can see what's happening in the language. And gradually then this shift becomes sort of the way of speaking, the way of writing. The shift becomes a drift. It, it, the instances of language, the, it's not just one instance here and one instance there. It, it adds up. It adds up until it becomes the way you write. The instances become the system. Professor David Butt put it this way. He said, Halliday's analyses of scientific discourse reveal a broad form of grammatical drift. The shifts, these shifts that we've been talking about in terms of grammatical metaphor, take on a novel intensity, a, a something that is novel, it's new intensity, a frequency. This frequency with which we turn verbs into nouns and, and adjectives into nouns and conjunctions into verbs to, to relate and so on, this becomes so frequent that it actually becomes the way one writes, especially within scientific discourse. Now, where did this come out from? Why did this happen? It happened because it was needed. As the need arose, Halliday describes this as the need arose for these more powerful abstract theories of experience, trying to be more abstract about the world. We took this metaphor making potential and we took what was sort of the common sense way of seeing the world and we impose on it. We take that dynamic sort of changing, which is what happens with a verb. It's it's, doesn't, it's not fixed, it doesn't stand still. But when you turn it into a noun, well, then that noun stands still. It is something. We reconstruct common sense reality into one with these regularities on experience. And as Halliday puts it, brought the environment more within our power to control it. The shift becomes a drift. The instances of language become the system, become the, it becomes the, the way that we 
express ourselves. What this means is that you develop a new variety of language. You, you, the language is evolving. The language is changing. And what you created is, is a particular way of writing, expressing yourself when it comes to the language of science. And what that means is how Halliday describes it, it is a register. And as he puts it, what has evolved is the scaffolding for scientific knowledge is a dedicated semiotic system. Out of those instances has arisen a new system of language, a variety of language, a way of writing for science, a special register of a language. Register. What's register? A variety defined according to use. And what does that mean? That means it could relate to what you're talking about, field. Who is talking to whom, tenor, how it is communicated, mode. These aspects define the context of situation. And in that context of situation, then how do you communicate? How do you use language? And we have expectations. We have expectations for given who you are and who you're talking to, given for the situation in which you find yourself, given the way you are communicating. Is it texting? Is it talking on the phone? Is it talking in person? All of these factors will enter into not only how we use language, but how we respond to language. Now, that means that when you try to talk about where language is going and what will happen in language, you can't predict it. Just as science does not have all the answers when it comes to predicting the partially lawless evolution produced by Darwinian pre-adaptations. That's why I mentioned Stuart Kaufman and this idea of Darwinian pre-adaptations. He's saying that in biology, in culture, you have no way to know. You, you're going for the alternative. You're going, and that alternative, what direction you go, that's unpredictable. It's unforeseen. It's unforeseeable. So too, then, the ceaseless creativity in language. Now, it is enabled by the wording, the grammar. You have meaning, but meaning must be sort of made visible. It must be expressed, must be communicated. And the means to do that is through the wording, through the grammar. Now, we can't then, the grammar enables this, but we cannot know how the grammar itself will change, or how it will be used, and how it will be employed, and what those connections will be between wording and meaning, between the grammar and meaning. It makes it even more difficult if our grammar is algorithmic, it's computational. If we think of language as being sort of, sort of mathematical, sort of as though we, it's how you, we, as though it can be computed. I'm not putting down computational linguistics, no. We can say something about, we can have some insight into how we do use language. But to, the point being, if that, that's not all language is, we will never sort of fully capture what is language and how language, how we make meaning. Because there's always that element of creativity. Why? Because there is that element of metaphor. Halliday says this, what is important is that we should be able to use the same theory and method of linguistic analysis, the same grammatics, as he puts it, whatever kind of text or subtext we are trying to interpret, whether Tennyson or Darwin, Mother Goose, or the Scientific American. Otherwise, if we simply approach each text with an ad hoc, do-it-yourself kit of 
private commentary. We have no way of explaining their similarities and their differences. The aesthetic and functional values that differentiate one text from another or one voice from another within the frontiers of the same text. Halliday describes language as being more than a semiotic system. It is a system that makes meanings. It is, as he puts it, a semogenic system. When he talks about meaning, he's talking about the, the metafunctions of language, how we construe experience, the experiential, how we combine our ideas, the logical, the interpersonal, how we enact social relationships, and how that meaning then materializes in the text. The metafunctions. Every language has a purpose, and that purpose to which we put language is to be able to construe the world, enact relationships, create the discourse. Now, as Halliday goes on to explain then what enables this meaning-making potential in language is what he calls the lexicogrammar. Not just the words, but the wording, how the words come together. So as he says, thinking about meaning means thinking grammatically. When he talks about meaning grammatically, then he's talking about the, the wording. And when he talks about how we, for example, construe the world, this is realized in the wording through the kinds of processes that we choose to, to describe what's happening, to who is initiating those processes, who's affected by it, the participants, what are the circumstances. We deal with the logical, how the, how the clauses combine. Are there dependent clauses? How do we see the meaning as it develops within the text and expands from one message to the next? So let me pose this question. By thinking grammatically, how much can one learn about how a text comes to mean what it does? How much can we learn? by applying Halliday's idea of thinking grammatically. Russell Mears, a emeritus professor of psychiatry at the University of Sydney, has written a very interesting book, The Poet's Voice in the Making of Mind. And from this book, he says this, the words of the poem are used in a symbolic way, having more than a single meaning. The effect of a few simple words combined in a particular way is to evoke a sense of reality that none of them possess alone. The nature of this reality is not precise. It is indefinite. So it's not just about the words, it's about the wording, how the, the words combine in a particular way to evoke a sense of reality that none of these words possess by themselves. Halliday did a very interesting study of Alfred Lord Tennyson's In Memoriam. And from the, the paper that he wrote about this, he, in that paper he says this, the grammar of this passage is that of, a, is that of spoken rather than of written language. This is seen most clearly in the clause complexes, also in the transitivity patterns where there is little nominalization or other grammatical metaphor and much of the lexical content is in the verbs. He continues, there is an excellent discussion of this in a little paper by Walker Gibson written in 1958 in the course of which he remarks, and here he quotes Gibson, I submit, I submit then that Tennyson's poetic imagination can sometimes be examined in terms of his grammar. This poet's poetic imagination can be examined in terms of his grammar. How? How does this happen? How, how do we get at the poet's imagination through the grammar? Rukhaya Hassan, in her book, Linguistics, Language, and Verbal Art, 
outlines how there are, in fact, as Mir has said already, there's, there's another order of meaning. There's another meaning. Now, there's a first order of meaning. That is how we, how we understand the text to begin with, how meaning and grammar and phonology all come together to produce a text. That's the first order. But there is a, there is a, a possibility of a second order of meaning turning the signs into something with a deeper meaning. And how this is achieved, she says, is through symbolic articulation. So unpack that. What is that? That's articulating symbols. What are symbols? Symbols are metaphors. So how are these metaphors articulated? She explains it's through a process of what she calls foregrounding. Professor David Butt from Macquarie University has said this in describing what, what, how foregrounding is achieved. Mobilizing the habitual patterns of grammatical choice into a non-habitual consistency. Taking the way that we use language normally and turning it into something with a non-habitual unexpected, yet deliberate, consistency. Well, what does that mean? That means you, you have a pattern, and against that pattern, that background, one foregrounds. And the purpose to which one puts this foregrounding, the, the reason for this foregrounding, which is a kind of symbolic articulation, which is a way of articulating symbols, the purpose is a theme, a motif, that second order of meaning, which as Hassan describes is the hypothesis put, being put forward by the verbal artist about some aspect of the life of social man. So what is this theme? Not in the Halliday sense, of course, of theme as the starting point of the message. No, this is more literary in the sense of it is the motif of the text. It is, it is the, that second order of meaning which is being achieved through mobilizing the habitual patterns of language choice and turning them into something with a non-habitual consistency against, against which one repatterns. Now, as, as Hassan explains, this, this theme may not be what initially engages the reader, but it's something that's going to stay in that reader's consciousness long after the wordings have been forgotten. Theme. It is the hypothesis. The hypothesis hypothesis about some aspect of the life of social man. As Hassan explains, the patterns of language are so deployed as to take in a particular direction, to take us in a particular direction. Each message is a, a message by itself, but the totality of these messages enunciates a theme. The theme becomes accessible by examination of the meaning of the individual messages. Yes, the messages combine, guided by the repatterning of patterns, the foregrounding against a background, thus producing a literary artifact, thus producing an extended metaphor. Now, Halliday, prefers the term deautomatization, Mukarovsky's term. He prefers it to foregrounding, since, as he puts it, what is at question, what is in question, is not simply prominence, but rather the, as he puts it, the partial freeing of the lower level systems, the grammar, from the control of the semantics, so that they become domains of choice in their own right. So to deautomatize means to try to interpret the grammar in terms that go beyond its direct realizational function. In other words, what the verbal artist is doing is artistically creating 
and automatization. That non-habitual consistency of these habitual patterns of grammatical choice, against which to then de-automatize, against which to repattern. Creating a pattern in order to break the pattern. So then the question Hassan asks is, how do we distinguish between an artistically intentional act of de-automatization or foregrounding versus just a statistically demonstrable prominence, which is not really in fact part of the artist's craft. It's not deliberate, it's not by design, and is not really intended to contribute to the overall meaning of the text. Foregrounding of a pattern depends upon two factors, contrast and consistency. Contrast. The example from, from Hassan's uh, work, uh, one of these examples that I like to go back to is uh, Les Murray's, The Widower in the Country. And from this poem, she identifies several kinds of contrast, several layers of language, transitivity. There's the doing is in contrast to every other process type. The widower is the doer in contrast with every other participant. There is a, a repetition of the conjunction and establishing a, a background of simple parataxis in contrast with complex clauses that employ parataxis, hypotaxis, and embedding. The tense, the future tense, is in, in contrast with other tenses. And theme in the Hallidayan sense, the widower is typically theme in contrast with other thematic choices. So these various levels of contrast. But then where is the consistency? David Butt puts it this way, consistency of choices across strata weaves what he calls the poem's existential fabric. Consistency. Where do these contrasts seem to align themselves together. And we notice that when we compare these, this kind of foregrounding, this consistent foregrounding involving the logical, the, the process types, transitivity and theme, we notice that it comes together at various locations throughout the poem, where what is happening is the poet is drawing us to those, uh, those those meanings within the poem, where what is being conveyed is the, his hypothesis about some aspect of the life of social man. The aching, the darkness, the screaming, this picture of what bereavement is about, this picture of mourning, this picture of the darkness and the loneliness that this widower feels. Hassan says this, she says, Les Murray's widower in the country poignantly points to its theme concerning the essence of humanity. To be human, to be an individual, you need to be with others. What makes human existence sane, what protects it from nightmarish chimera is another's company. Foregrounding involves contrast, consistency. Pointing you to a theme, pointing you to what this is this verbal artist's hypothesis about some aspect of the life of social man. In this case, it was the need for others, as, as Hassan interprets that second order of meaning. Now, today, what I wanted to do with you is to, to look at two examples of verbal art. And I'm wanting to do so by looking at what's going on linguistically. Now, the two texts that I'm going to be talking about, both of them challenge typical cultural norms. They, they challenge our expectations about what should be 
highly valued. Both have gone on to win popular acclaim and praise as outstanding works of verbal art, even though they go against the grain of what is expected. The first one I'm going to look at is a spoken word artist who in the past season of America's Got Talent at his audition introduced the judges to something they were quite unused to being able to see in this kind of show. It's not magic, it's not dance, it's, mu it's not music, it's the spoken word. This was the reaction when he came out on stage to begin with. Hi, how are you? <laughs> what is your name? My name is Brandon Leak. Hi, Brandon Leak. And where are you from, Brandon? I am from a small little city called Stockton, California. Stockton, California. And what do you do for a living? Uh, for a living, I, I work at a high school and a college, but I also run poetry workshops with youth in my city. Oh, well, that's wow. wonderful. Yeah. Wow. So poetry, is that, is that what you're going to be doing tonight? Yes, I'm actually the first spoken word artist that you guys are ever going to have hit this stage. So I'm super excited to bring poetry to y'all. Tell me, because uh, I don't really understand poetry, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a great intro for you. I, I bring more about life experience, things that everyday people go through. And, and where could this lead to if you did well on the show, Brandon? Well, I have like a huge aspiration of being able to put on my own large production one-man show. Okay. So t tonight's poem, is it something you wrote? Oh, I only perform stuff that I write. Never be able to perform anything else. Well, and what is it? What is this one about? So tonight's poem is actually a, an ode to my sister. Are you close to your sister? Very much. She's here with me now. Oh, she's back, backstage? Kind of. <laughs> well, we already love you. Make us love your poem. Beautiful, I got you for that. That's sort of unusual, unexpected, that uh, someone coming out to have a poem, speak a poem, this spoken word performer. Now, what was the response after he gave his performance? Wow. It is a wow. Flowers across the sea, memories are what they used Gosh. to be. You're tearing up. My brother passed away the same year that your sister passed away. Man. Yeah, I can feel your pain. I know what this is. I know what it is to have somebody taken from you without you knowing. But it was very beautiful for me. Thank you. What an amazing tribute. There's something very, very special about you. Thank you. Really. This is a very difficult thing for me to judge. I shouldn't be judging it. I just want to compliment you on what you just did because it was uh, extraordinary. Thank you for so much. Really? So much. Well, it's amazing to me that on season 15, it's the first time that we're hearing somebody of spoken word there was something more raw in the way it's like singing and talking and just being a human a cappella. no music no nothing just a raw heart beating in front of us we feel your pain we feel your love and you moved me to do this they speak of a better place they speak of kingdom, kingdoms and how they go. They speak of freedom, freedom and marching drums, freedom and marching drums. You're amazing, buddy. You can see the reaction. Wow. Now what wowed the judges? the golden buzzer it's basically a free pass to the live show so it's a big deal and each judge has is allowed one golden buzzer halliday says this in real life he sex he says texts carry value 
text carry value. Yes, we can see it. And we need to explain that value in terms of what we know, what we know about semiosis, about meaning, and how meaning is made. Okay, I can map out the, the spoken word performance that, that was given, and it's very paratactic. There's a, there's a beginning and there's a, a closing. And in between, it's quite, we could say, quite paratactic. I have two facts for you. One, I'm six feet tall. <laughs> and two, love is the most vulnerable thing one will ever have. And you must learn to hold on to it loosely. So when it leaves, it won't exit so painfully. On July 14th, 1996, an angel was brought to this earth. Her name, Danielle Marie Gibson, but I only know her as Puff. Her smile is as wide as the universe. Her eyes, they glimmer like the star. She is my world and my sister. I, just four years old at the time, learned what it meant to love selflessly for on days in which my strength was but knee high. Seeing her smiling face would make my soul fly, but... The but signals something is changing, however. It almost draws a line through what we have seen just already and what is to follow. What we've seen already are basically simple clauses, uh, some embedding, yes, rhyme, a rhyming that we see throughout some of the, the clauses and so forth. But now what is what will be the shape of things to come? Let's see. Sentences 11 through 13. On March 23rd, 1997, I've been groundbound because she left Earth to go back home amongst the stars right next to God. But I was left here to manufacture wings out of tears and broken dreams. Yet I'm still haunted by these nightmares because I have a really creative mind. And sometimes it designs these alternate realities where she is still here still alive and all the things I wish we could have done are played again and again and again and I'm tired of playing God because I got to come to terms with the fact that my sister ain't never coming back. Interestingly, you can see, I uh, looked at the sort of the lexical density, the, the content words per sentence, and you'll notice here 13, the one, the one sentence that you just listened to, there's this peak quite noticeably compared to the, the rest of what was being said on this particular sentence. Now, of course, it, it, that is a byproduct of the fact that you have quite a few clauses that have been combined into this sentence. But it draws your attention to that particular sentence and those thoughts, and it, it also other factors have entered into it as well. You, you sense the emotion in his voice. When we take a look at sentence 13, we notice that there's quite a lot of what we would say are paratactic conjunctions. And, 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 and there's cause, which, because, but in this very colloquial way of speaking, Sentences 14 and 15. And that's the cost of love. Caring for someone so much that you can't imagine living life without them. Staring at a grave like, how about I trade my six feet for yours, but that's not real. And I know I said earlier to hold on to love loosely. So when it leaves, it won't exit so painfully. But if this pain and these memories are all that I got left of you, I won't never regret these scars from just trying to hold on to you. So that's the spoken word performance. Now there's some things to, to note about what we observe. And one of the points that we, we see is at the beginning you have this sort of combination to hold on to leaves, won't exit, and it's repeated at the end in sentence 15 we come back to where he began. There's repeated mention of six feet tall at the beginning and toward the end. 
there's a use of rhyme. We notice that we see the use of rhyme in, in sentences one through 10, up until that but, and then not again until sentence 15, rhyme returns. We notice about midway through at 11, after that but, there is a shift, shift from active voice, she left, but then for the poet, there is a shift to act from active to passive voice. Ben Groundbound was left haunted. He isn't the he isn't the initiator. He is the one that is affected. We notice that there is from eleven onwards a, a lot of conjunctions, especially and until we get to that a pair of butts in 11, which marks that difference, but then also 12, where we see that contrast between the active, she left, and I was left. 13, we notice again, it all sort of seems to gather at this point. We, we, didn't, we notice that there is some hypotaxis, cuz. We notice that peak in terms of lexical density. We notice the increased use of hypotaxis then in 14 and in 15. We notice this contrast in these clauses, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Some observations. We notice the presence versus absence of rhyme. We notice the simple versus the complex clauses. We notice the use of parataxis versus hypotaxis in 13 through 15, and the elevated lexical density, particularly in sentence 13. All sort of pointing, these contrasts pointing us to, especially what we see is, the, is that what moved those judges, the pain that he felt in the loss of his sister. So what was the theme? It comes full circle. Where he, how he began is how it ends, but with a different outlook on life and loss. But the rhyme returns. So I ask again the question, by thinking grammatically, how much can one learn about how a text comes to mean what it does? Of course, we don't cover everything. What we do get is some of it. I remember after analyzing one of the, the poems by Edwin Tumbu, and I asked him if I, I got it in terms of what it was that he was doing in the poem. And I remember his response, some of it, some of it. Okay, let's take the second. The second example is David Foster Wallace's commencement speech delivered at Kenyon College, and we see it is at the top of Time Magazine's list of top 10 commencement speeches, David Foster Wallace. And David Foster Wallace is uh, considered a, a genius when it comes to uh, his writing. A Time Magazine, in identifying it with the top 10, said this, this address at Kenyon was vintage Wallace, smart, occasionally meandering discussion of the issues that consumed him, from the banality of life to the meaning of consciousness. I know that this stuff probably doesn't sound fun and breezy and grandly inspirational, he concluded. What it is, so far as I can see, is the truth. The capital T truth is about life before death. It is about making it to 30 or maybe 50 without wanting to shoot yourself in the head. All the reasons Wallace didn't make it to 50 are apparent here. In hindsight, the speech reads like the first draft of a suicide note for an author who, who took his own life last year at age 46. And while it's a macabre read, there's tons that's worthwhile here. The speech crackles with wit and intelligence and offers tricks for escaping the depression to which Wallace ultimately succumbed. Okay, let's take a look at a part of the address. 
One of the things I've highlighted here, if we take a look at the verbs that are used here, we see a lot about thinking and a lot of relational processes mentioned. We notice that uh, I've highlighted in yellow those simple clauses, those that stand out. The point here is that I think this is one part of what teaching me how to think is really supposed to mean, to be just a little less arrogant to have just a little critical awareness about myself and my certainties, because a huge percentage of the stuff that I tend to be automatically certain of is, it turns out, totally wrong and deluded. I have learned this the hard way, as I predict you graduates will too. Here is just one example of the total wrongness of something I tend to be automatically sure of. Everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe. <laughs> the realest, most vivid and important person in existence. We rarely talk about this sort of natural basic self-centeredness because it's so socially repulsive, but it's pretty much the same for all of us. It is our default setting, hardwired into our boards at birth. Think about it. There is no experience you have had that you are not at the absolute center of. The world as you experience it is there in front of you or behind you, to the left or right of you, on your TV or your monitor, and so on. Other people's thoughts and feelings have to be communicated to you somehow, but your own are so immediate, urgent, real. One thing I did when I examined uh, David Foster Wallace's talk was to, to go back and to look at the lexical density again, which is like with Brandon Leakes, a byproduct of the, the combination of taxes relations and embedding and so forth. But what was striking in his talk was the, that this, these peaks are repeated, but not just the peaks that we notice. The peaks stand out, especially because of what what precedes them is an especially low lexical density, such as we see in five, a very simple, I have learned this the hard way, as I predict you graduates will too. But then followed by this very high lexical density, which draws our attention, the, the contrast draws our attention. As he says, here is just one example of the total wrongness of something I tend to be automatically sure of. Everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe, the realest, most vivid, and important person in existence. Now, these contrasting valleys and peaks, one could ask, are they accidental or are they deliberate? We see it again. In the next part here, again, we will notice the simple this is not a matter of virtue. This question gets very tricky, but then followed by a peak of high lexical density. Notice the contrast between 15 and 16, where he says it's a matter of my choosing to do the work of somehow altering or getting free of my natural hardwired default setting, which is to be deeply and literally self-centered and to see and interpret everything through this lens of self. And it comes at us as like waves throughout the speech. We notice it in, in 19 and 20. This question gets very tricky. And then again, repeated, one of the points that he's on is the contrast here. As we can see in lexical density, which is again, as I said, the byproduct of the clauses that are combined together. But in these instances, what we notice is this repeated high lexical density, very often contrasted with what has preceded it as being quite simple and of a very low lexical density. We see it at the end. Now the focus of his talk was on, as we can see from this word cloud, how one thinks, how one construes the world. It's not your typical commencement speech. He himself says so. He says this is this is a standard requirement. He starts off with a story about this is water and the, and the fish and so forth. He says this is a standard requirement of U.S. commencement. And then he goes on to say that he's not going to be that wise old fish. And he again says when he concludes, I know this stuff probably doesn't sound fun and breezy and grandly inspirational. 
the way a commencement speech is supposed to sound. I know that this stuff probably doesn't sound fun and breezy or grandly inspirational the way a commencement speech is supposed to sound. What it is, as far as I can see, is the capital T truth with a whole lot of rhetorical niceties stripped away. You are, of course, free to think of it whatever you wish. But please don't just dismiss it as some finger-wagging Dr. Laura sermon. None of this stuff is really about morality or religion or dogma or big fancy questions of life after death. The capital T truth is about life before death. It is about the real value of a real education, which has almost nothing to do with knowledge and everything to do with simple awareness. Awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us all the time, that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over, this is water, this is water. It is unimaginably hard to do this, to stay conscious and alive in the adult world day in and day out. Which means yet another grand cliche turns out to be true. Your education really is the job of a lifetime. And it commences now. I wish you way more than luck. It's the anti-text. When I say anti-text, I'm talking along the lines of what Halliday was saying about an anti-language. He says this, the anti-language arises when the alternative reality is a counter-reality, set up in opposition to some established norm. It is, this, it is thus not the distance between the two realities, but the tension between them that is significant. The distance need not be very great. The one is, in fact, a metaphorical variant of the other. This anti-text, this, this commencement speech, which was an anti-commencement speech, contrary to every expectation of the genre, presents, in fact, an alternative to our default setting. It is advocating a counter-reality. He says this, that is real freedom, that is being educated, understanding how to think the alternative is unconsciousness, the default setting, the rat race, the, not, the constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. What's the theme? What hypothesis was he presenting? His, basically, his hypothesis was the, the need to deautomatize to go counter to our default setting. And he does so through deautomatization, through giving us an alternative commencement speech, the anti-text. Now, the whole point of all of this is really when these verbal artists, whether it's Brandon Leake or David Foster Wallace, are presenting their their pieces of work, the purpose, and that really sort of contributes to our sense of them being art, is what we would call the sociotherapeutic function, an eco-linguistic function. Hassan refers to this as to make readers, she says, more human than they were before they came to read that literature, to really change people's perspective on things. Russell Mears talks about how writing poems has a healing purpose. Along similar lines as uh, Professor Rukaya Hassan, he talks about a, a therapeutic function. And he describes the structure of mind as like the structure of a poem. Now, question, how is the structure of a poem or some other instance of verbal art, how is it like the structure of mind. Mears talks about there being two modes of thought, two modes of language. This is, this is well accepted, that two hemispheres, the left and right hemispheres of the brain, corresponding to each is a particular mode of thought and a mode of language. There is a complementarity between them. And Mears goes on to describe this complementarity as, on the one hand, the, the left hemisphere is 
oriented to communication and purpose, whereas the, the right hemisphere is more language associated with symbolic play. We might see it as a distinction between the aesthetic, the right hemisphere, and the functional, the left hemisphere. Now, he goes on to talk about the fact that the evolutionary trajectory of Homo sapiens is toward the ability to construct a story. And certainly we know that a story figures prominently in, in verbal art, but he's saying the prologue to this is a proto-language that involves the use of symbols, metaphor. The crucial narrative which Homo sapiens evolved that gave it an evolutional advantage was not, however, any kind of story. It had the structure of myth. And the structure of myth depends on the coordination of the two forms of language, the two modes of thought which have, as he points out, different developmental pathways and neurological bases. One concerns syntactical development, the verbal, and the other, the symbolic, the verbal versus the mythical, or as we've talked about, the functional versus the aesthetic. Now then, what is then this myth-making potential? Drawing on the coordination of these two forms of language and two modes of thought, what are they? It, Drawing on this, both the functional, the purposeful, and the aesthetic, the symbolic, the metaphorical. Uh, myth. Carl Jung talked about myth, especially after his break with Freud. He was on the verge of a breakdown. He had no clear direction in his life. And so attempting to find a way out of his chaos, he asks himself this question, what is the myth? you are living. And he replies to himself, I found no answer to this question. I had to admit that I was not living a myth or even in a myth. So in the most natural way, I took it upon myself to get to know my myth. And I regarded this as the task of tasks. He was searching for a myth that would have the effect of a, a picture of reality. A picture of reality which he felt to be most truly his own. Similar to what Mears describes as this metaphoric cinematic screen on, on which is portrayed by the verbal artist, by any of us, a partially glimpsed personal reality. The metaphorical, but beyond metaphor, myth. The coordination of these two modes of language, two modes of thought. So where is the art in verbal art? It is in the, the mobilization of the habitual patterns of language choice into a non-habitual consistency, a pattern against which to foreground the artist's hypothesis, the message, the theme about some aspect of social life. It's in the coordination of the aesthetic through the deployment of the artist's craft and technique and the functional, through communicating the, the artist's hypothesis, the, the message, the, there's a purpose, creating out of that an extended metaphor, the myth. Out of this coordination between the aesthetic the artist's craft and the functional, the artist's message, comes our myth-making potential to create extended metaphors, myths, with the power to move people and hopefully to heal. Thank you very much for your, your attention.